Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a poet that's very well known among Catholics, but who hasn't really come up on this podcast uh, yet before. We'll be talking about the great Jesuit 19th century poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. I will note that Manley is spelt with an E between the L and the Y. It's very frequent that I that I find people spelling it just as the adjective manly, or the adverb manly, I should say. Uh, wait, no, it is an adjective. Anyway, move, moving on beyond that small point, uh, I'm really happy to have a returning guest on the podcast today, uh, Holly Ordway, who has been on here, I want to say twice before, maybe three times, but I think twice. Um, she is the Cardinal Francis George Professor of Faith and Culture at Word on Fire and the Visiting Professor of Apologetics at Houston Christian University. Um, the last time she was on was to discuss her award-winning book, Tolkien's Modern Reading, Middle Earth Beyond the Middle Ages. And uh, that was published by Word on Fire. And uh, so is the book we're discussing today, which is As Kingfishers Catch Fire, Selected and Annotated Poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins, but also forthcoming from Word on Fire, also by Holly. Later this year will be uh, a major work, Tolkien's Faith, a Spiritual Biography, which is available for pre-order now. And I'll sh surely have her back on the show later uh, in a few months to discuss that as well. Very much looking forward to that. But for now, we'll be talking about Gerard Manley Hopkins. So welcome back to the show, Holly. Well, it is a pleasure to be back, Thomas. Gerard Manley Hopkins, he has quite an interesting, um, an interesting life. He is connected to um, John Henry Newman, is he not? Yes, he was actually received into the Catholic Church by Newman. So there's a very direct connection. Hmm. So he was raised Anglican, I would assume? Yes, he grew up in a, in a totally sort of typical Anglican middle-class family and had really a, a projected career of, of middle-class Anglican brilliance as a scholar. Um, he hmm. did exceptionally well at Oxford. One of his professors called him the Star of Balliol. And hmm. then he upset the whole apple cart by finding himself convicted that he needed to become a Catholic and join the Catholic Church. And so he was received um, into the church by Newman. Um, and he was able to take his degree at Oxford because when he started, he was still an Anglican. Because mm. even at that time, <laughs> all matriculating students had to affirm the 39 articles. Um, and because he had started as an Anglican, he could affirm them. And he was able to finish because they didn't ask for an affirmation upon receiving the degree. So he speaks through his degree um, in that last sort of window of of um, of discrimination against Catholics at uh, at Oxford, which stopped not long after that, right? Not too long after 1871 um, is the Universities Test Act put an end to that, or at least put okay. an end to the more overt form right. of it. Um, it was still very difficult to be a Catholic at Oxford for many years. How soon did he enter the Jesuit order after his conversion? Uh, pretty pretty quickly afterwards. Um, he you know, he gave a little bit of thought to becoming an oratorian because of, of Newman's influence, but right. pretty quickly discerned that it was the, the Jesuit order that was where his calling was and served quite a long um, novitiate. Like they, they put a long you know, formational process. He served that in Wales. Um, and in fact, it was during that time, during his Jesuit training, that he had this renewed um, sort of poetic inspiration hmm. as he, you know, it's interesting, it kind of goes against some of the stereotyped assumptions about, you know, Catholics, Catholic priests, Jesuits, and, 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 you know, what they think about literature. Hopkins himself, in a sort of fit of scrupulosity, had burned many of his early poems, thinking, I'm going to just dedicate myself to God, and that means not spending time in poetry. But when he was in the Jesuit training, um, it was actually his his superior who encouraged him to take up writing poetry again. Um, and with that encouragement, Hopkins was able to to realize, okay, this isn't this isn't an either or. This is something I can do as part of my vocation as a priest. And the tension, of course, is as for every writer with other responsibilities, finding the time. But from that point on, when he wrote the Wreck of the Deutschland. Um, that he felt that, yes, this is something I can do as a priest. Um, and mm -hmm. it was affirmed by, yeah, by his superiors there. Now you mentioned him being very brilliant. Um, what, what were his more academic interests? Well, he never, he never really published anything academically. Um, he, 
which is part of why he was frustrated. He was a talented classicist. That's what he what he was um, teaching classics and philosophy. Um, I see uh, Greek, um, Latin. Um, eventually, he was you know teaching that towards the end of his life in uh, in in Dublin, and he wanted to do some commentaries and things like that. But he never he never really got anywhere with with those. Um, but we should remember he died when he was only forty four. Hmm. So he died very young um, right. and had been suffering from. Um, poor health for years so his brilliance is really what we have of it we have it in the poems which are just dazzling performances right but we also see it too um we don't we don't see it in the poems but related to that is he was a keen he had a keen artist's eye and so Hmm. he also did many sketches um some of which you can you can see and that I for detail of the natural world is something that makes its way into the poems as well. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, so I, I, I seem to remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, I seem to remember hearing that he was so brilliant and the Jesuits didn't quite know what to do with him. So he kind of lived in obscurity to a certain extent after entering the Jesuit order. Is that correct? He did, and they didn't quite know what to do with him, but but he also didn't quite know what to do with himself in a sense. Hmm. Um you know, he wrote he wrote the wreck of the Deutschland, his first major poem, um, in his in a very fresh and new style, um, and with with some new you know, rhythmic approaches that that he was working on, and it was at first accepted by the Jesuit um, magazine, and then they said, well, on second thought, no. <laughs> so they first accepted it and then retracted their acceptance, and so that was never published. Um, and I think that left him a little bit ambivalent about whether his work was ever going to be well received. Hmm. He did make a few attempts to publish his poetry later on because he did have his friend Robert Bridges, who became his literary executor, was attempting to set up some opportunities for him to publish. And he he started that, but those fell through and he never really followed through to to make it happen. But again, hmm. he was ill, he was overworked and he died when he was only 44. Um, right. And so if we look at the, you know, the trajectory of his career, he had served as a, um, a priest um, in urban work. You know, he was put into some slum parishes in Birmingham and Liverpool. He mm. served briefly as the curate of St. Aloysius in Oxford, which is the same church at which um, J.R. Tolkien worshipped for uh, a lot of his life. So he served as curacy in urban areas. He served as a priest in urban areas. And it turns out that he was a good priest. He was a good member of the team in those areas. He was hmm. very, there's a, he was himself very critical of his own preaching. Um, and it seems that at least in his preaching training, he didn't exactly wow his um, teachers and his classmates. So he was very hard on himself. And I think there has sprung up this idea that that he wasn't any good as a priest or he had no pastoral skills. But that's not really the case. It's not borne out by the more detailed records of his work. Um, Mm. He wasn't a top-notch preacher, but he was dedicated to his work. He went and and did it. He was part of a team of Jesuits working in these, these areas. And they saw that a better fit for him would be as a professor. So they moved him over to be teaching um, classics at, you know, the, the university in Dublin, which was a very difficult place to be working at that time it was literally falling to bits. Um, he probably died because of typhoid caught from bad drains, which is really grim. So hmm. the university buildings killed him in effect. <laughs> wow. Um, how many poems do we have by him? I couldn't give you the number off the top of my head. I'm sorry. It's not a it's not a great number, is it? No, no, it's not. Um, I'm gonna say, I'm I'm guessing, but I'm gonna say a hundred or two hundred. Um, okay. So we're we're talking, you know, more than more than twenty, but less than we have for you know these major poets like Wordsworth, yeah. who you know, have just buckets, you know, right. of poems. And how many poems are included in this uh, new collection? There are, if I am not mistaken, thirty-seven. Okay, so uh, before we get into the poems, I'd like to to talk about him as a poet a little bit more generally and his his importance as a poet. I mean, you mentioned he had this this fresh style. Um, uh, I've always thought of him as a very musical poet, um, but a musical in in sometimes more radical ways than uh, previous more traditional formal poetry. Although he certainly is a formal poet, um, and. Uh, 
well, you could I think it would be fair to call him uh, something of a proto modernist poet. Um, do you think that's accurate? It's yes and no. Um, but he he certainly was a poet who was greatly admired by the early modernists, like you know, Eliot, for instance. And yeah. I think um, the answer to that is in sort of his his historical placement is very interesting because he is technically a Victorian poet, but he does not fit the late Victorian poetic world very well. Um, and that poetic world, by the end of the Victorian era, the late Victorian era, um, poetry was extremely popular, but it was also becoming kind of stultified. They were poets were churning out just reams of, of versification that was, you know, very pat, very trite, very same old, same old. Um, and Hopkins is very different from all that. He's working with traditional forms, like the sonnet is one of his primary forms, and that's a classic form. That's a very traditional classic form. But he approaches it with this vividness of language, with a with a um, sort of sometimes anarchic approach to syntax. His syntax right. is is sometimes very fragmented. And I think that is yeah. perhaps what some of the modernists like Eliot in the wasteland are seeing in him, because he is, in a sense, trying to cram so much meaning into every line that his his syntax sort of breaks down under the under the right. effect of it. He's using words in new ways. He invents words. Um, he reverses syntax. He omits words. And it makes sense. It's, it's not that he's disrupting the reading experience so much that you don't understand it it's he's he's very compressed he can be very mm. elliptical right and so there's, there's so much there you have to work a little bit more to get at it right. than you do for the other late victorian poets so at the time i mean one can understand why his work didn't meet with immediate approval in his immediate cultural context they they just didn't know what to make of him mm. but then the first world war happened um, and in many ways, Hopkins, although he died before the war, his approach is so in tune with that, this shattering experience that that breaks open every category of, of understanding the world. I mean, we cannot mm. overstate how culturally traumatic and shattering the Great War was. Um, and now at this point, his literary executor, Robert Bridges, brings out the selected poems in 1918. Bridges was a very good literary executor. He bided his time. He waited until he felt that there was an audience who might possibly understand his friend. Mm. Brings it out, um, and it, it wasn't you know, instantly a success, but it picked up greater and greater interest. And I think that moment was ripe for people to see, here is somebody who is understanding the raw you know, the raw nature of reality, of beauty and sorrow. Um, and he's put it in these poems. And that spoke to people in 1918. And it continues to speak to us today, I think, very, very powerfully. Yeah, um, I'm currently learning Latin. And Hopkins syntax kind of reminds me of the mixed up, uh, you know, word order uh, in Latin. I mean, from an English speaking perspective, obviously. Um uh, but, you know, there, yes, he is trying to cram meaning in there, but there also does seem to be like a musical element, almost as though the words are rearranged as to what will give a, a pleasing musical effect. And there's a very sonically dense and kind of crunchy uh, feeling to his poetry, which is something that I always enjoy, um, uh, something that you almost might also find in, say, Dylan Thomas in terms of like the density of the alliteration and all these different kind of um, – uh, just, just really packed in uh, sounds that you kind of like have to. You have to be careful not to trip over when you when you're reading it um, out loud. Um, and it's interesting you made that connection with Thomas because again, he's he's a Welsh poet, and Hopkins is very much influenced, I think, by his time in Wales. And hmm. I think those the two poets. There's a lot in common there. I think you know in terms of that musicality. And Hop, I completely agree. Hopkins is a tremendously musical poet. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't say much about this in the collection but for specialists who are interested in hopkins i mean his whole concept of sprung rhythm where he's developing a new sort of a new technique for expressing the natural rhythms of english language in his yeah. poetry you know that's something I, again i don't go into it in this volume but that's an area that has been of great interest to a lot of people but as an ordinary reader of his poems 
we benefit from the fact that Hopkins himself paid very close attention to that musicality, to how the poems would sound when they were read out loud. And I, they right. do reward reading out loud more than I think a lot of poets do. They really reward that. Yes. Well, and and uh, it's if your poems are going to be difficult to understand at first reading, it's very important them, for them to be musical and enjoyable on that level. Um, I mean, I certainly don't understand what Dylan Thomas is on about um, in general, <laughs> but uh, but I just enjoy the sound of his poems. And as a musician, I I was I'm able to appreciate poems uh, poets more quickly if they have that going on, um, which is very um, very interesting. You know, I I. I this is kind of an aside, but I just read Wordsworth's uh, essay, his preface to lyrical ballads, and one thing he mentions is the importance of meter in, um, you know, in moderating any passions that are expressed, that are communicated to the reader, such that the overall impression is one of pleasure. And it just made me think of modern, not meaning meaning Eliot, but the past several decades of poetry, in which all you get is kind of the poet's subjective passions and and it's not moderated by meter and so there's really not much regard for the reader at all in in that sense so but uh uh hopkins certainly has a meaning it's not just his personal confessions that we're getting and uh also very musical and uh disciplined um even though in according to his own kind of the demands of his own genius um so uh, unless there's anything else to, to say about his poetry in general, maybe we can go ahead and get into some specific poems. Yes, let's. Um, so I, I was thinking we could start with The Wind Hover, uh, subtitled To Christ Our Lord. Indeed. So this, this, is, um, this is one of my favorite Hopkins poems. And I first encountered this particular poem when I was about... 17 as an undergraduate, um, not Christian at that time, and I had n really no idea what it was about, um, but I loved it. <laughs> so there was something in that, again, that musicality and that imagery that seized my heart, you know, um, so many years ago and, uh, and, and still does. So why don't I read it out loud, and then we can talk about what's going on in this poem. Um, so The Wind Hover. I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding, hi there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy, then off, off forth on swing. As a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, oh, I, air, pride, plume, here, buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plow down Cillian shine. And blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Okay, well, this this gives us an opportunity to talk. We, we didn't talk about the, the purpose of the book yet, uh, and this is a perfect example of why you decided to read this book. So maybe you can, before we talk about the poem specifically, you can mention that. Yes, yeah, so this, I, you know, as I sort of mentioned already, I've been thinking and reading um, about Hopkins for 30 years and loving his poetry and teaching his poetry for many years for everywhere from undergraduates to graduate students and to, you know, ordinary people in lectures. And I have realized that people love his poems when they understand what he's talking about, but the language and the syntax is often quite a barrier. Right. We needed an annotated edition. There is no annotated edition until now. Um, mm, wow. There, you would, it's crazy. I thought, and I used to look for these editions as a teacher. Well, come on, surely there is a properly annotated edition. No, there is not. Um, so that was my real motive hmm. behind this wow. book is to make the book that I always wanted as a, as a teacher and a reader, frankly. Right. So this book is um, fully annotated by me. Um, every poem has complete facing page annotations. And this is something I chose to make this book as readable as possible, because you want to be able to enjoy the poem, 
Um, and we also need to understand what's going on in it. And I, as a reader, find it slightly disruptive when I'm reading a poem to have all sorts of little dots and circles and numbers and the bottom of the page all cluttered up in very small print. So I decided to adopt something that the Folger Shakespeare Library yes. does. Yes, yeah. That was my inspiration. Those are fantastic additions to the Shakespeare plays. Yep. So each page has the, on the right-hand page, the text, on the left-hand page, glosses for any words and cultural concepts that appear in the facing page. So that's what I've done um, for each of the poems in As Kingfisher's Catch Fire and annotated very extensively, both from my experience teaching it, um, knowing, okay, this is where students and ordinary readers are gonna trip up. Um, mm. And also where I, as a reader, thought, okay, well, I'm sort of skimming over this word, but let me look into it more in depth. Because one of the things I found as I was researching to, to do the annotations was how specific Hopkins is in his terminology about the natural world. He uses words that are very specifically describing landscape features, plants, trees, right. birds. And so I've lost all of those. So you know that that's what he has in mind when he's he's giving right. this image. When you're reading uh, The Lord of the Rings, too, by Tolkien, you know, you have to Google what is a sword, you know, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> There's a lot of really specific references. And that's one interesting thing with this, these annotations is that, okay, a lot of a lot of great poems can benefit from annotations because of because they're old and because they use turns of phrase that we don't understand or uh, strange syntax or different uses of, of familiar words or, uh, you know, yes, flowers, trees, things like that. There's a bit of that in this poem, animals uh, in this book. But um, but uh, also, you know, he's got his own peculiar syntax and our, our, the difficulty of it is not really at all a function of the age of the poems. It's just that it's his peculiar way of approaching it. And so both for the sort of normal reasons of, you know, unfamiliar words and, you know, somebody might not be familiar with botany or whatever, uh, but uh, but also because of his own peculiar style that the annotations are very helpful. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I do a fair bit of paraphrasing certain right. phrases in there, um, including in the wind hover. So for instance, you know, um, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, I annotate that as, as an ice skater sweeps around a turn on the ice. Hmm. So once you know what that means, you can see, oh, he's, he's using the technique of, of focusing on just one part of it as the skate's heel. Okay. The heel of the skater on the, on the ice skates sweeps smooth on a bow bend. Okay. You know, he's ice skating. So it's a bow bend. It's a, it's around the bow of the river. So once you know that you get the picture he's giving you, but it can be a bit impenetrable until you realize, oh, it's an ice skater. That's what he's doing. Right. So I do a lot of that in these, and that was great, great fun to unpack them, um, to mm. say, let, let me give you an entry point into this. And and then you and then you can really see, oh, what a neat, what a neat collection of images he's got here. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask, and I know we're not going to talk about the rhythm much, but um of all the, the we're gonna read about four poems here in this episode, and of all of them, this I found the most challenging to read out loud myself and sort of know where the emphasis should be. They've got um in the first several lines, there's a lot of really Long lines, there's sort of uh, where he, he puts, he ends the line in the middle of a word in the first line, kingdom, king is the end, and dumb is the beginning of the next line. Um, so over the years, how have you kind of uh, figured out sort of like where the pulse is or how to, how to make this um, audible both in its, its sort of line breaks and in the, the rhythm but also in the continuity of the thoughts? Well, part of that this is a great question. Part of that is just loss of experience reading poetry um, mm -hmm. and, and knowing, for instance, to to go with the meaning and not with not being simply guided by the end of the lines. You know, that's the number one tip for reading a good poem out loud. Don't just stop dead at the end of the line. Pause where the meaning pauses. I mean, you can give slight pauses right. at the ends of lines, but you really want to follow the meaning rather than just stop at the end of it. And mm -hmm. this is a particularly good example. I've even talked about this in the introduction um, because he's he's so playful with his with his rhyming. But I mean, kingdom. He's he's rhyming king with wing, 
but doing it by breaking it in half. It's kingdom, but why not? He's Hopkins. He will break his word in half and make his right ending rhyme word the first half of it. So if you if you I think the key is to realize that this is actually a sonnet. It's a very tightly structured sonnet. It's a um Italian style sonnet. It's got the the eight and the six. And if you break into that and you take away the strange to us indentations and the extra spaces, um, then you can see, oh, it really is in that sonnet structure and sonnets characteristically use iambic pentameter. Um, and that is itself the natural rhythm of English. English wants to have the iambic meter. So if you know that that's your baseline meter, the iambic is the da dum to be or not to be. That is the question. Five beats in a line, um, mm -hmm. uh, alternating soft and and stressed. You can do that. I this is gonna. I'm gonna do it deliberately. Sing song. I okay. caught this morning's morning's minion king, and then we get to the next line. Now we have a couple of he's he's irregular kingdom of couple of unstressed ones, daylight, dauphin, dapple, dawn, drawn. Okay, he's ramping up the alliteration. That's irregular. Falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him, steady air. So he's got a basic pulse of okay. the classic sonnet meter that he deliberately disrupts at certain points with things like alliteration. Yeah. Um, but if you've got that basic pulse, that allows you to feel yeah. the flow of it. And the challenge is to know where something is kind of like a triplet feel inserted in there and things like that. Yeah, and that's and that's where I think it benefits. These are almost like speed bumps to help us slow down and, and read it properly because mm. you can't rush through a Hopkins poem. You just can't. Um, so it forces you to slow down and to savor a line and to really pay attention to well, what's the flavor of this? How does this roll off the tongue? What What's the meaningful word in this line? Um, has he given me any clues to it, like putting and all in small capitals? Um, right. The and is not a word that would normally get a stress in mm -hmm. a line. Right. Um, so he's it, if we slow down and, and savor, then it gives us what we need to see what he's doing. We've got the basic structure that he gives us, that that regular iambic pentameter and that sonnet structure. Um, so we, we have the, the, the eight and the six, the, the initial part, and then the turn in the sonnet. Yeah. This, this, is an, this is one of the things I love about Hopkins is he's using traditional elements to give us a place to start with, to give us a substance so that then he can do things with that that are exciting, that are innovative, that surprise us, um, that shock us even as poets, as, as readers of poetry. But it doesn't come out of left field because he's given us a grounding for it. And how are you dealing with dappled, dawn, drawn? To me, that sounds like it really has to be drawn out, you know, so to speak. Um, it doesn't feel like something you can force into a quick I am exactly. kind of it's, thing. Exactly. It's, um, you know, I, I am myself a, a poet and I write sonnets. That's my poetic form. And one of the things as a, as a good poet, you have to not let rules be a straitjacket. You've got to be right. willing to not have the rhythm be perfectly regular. Because if you yeah. have things be too perfectly regular all the time, then, then what you get, in fact, is a characteristic of late Victorian um, mm -hmm. poetry, which was absolute regularity and perfection of meter to the point that it was like a snooze fest. Um, right. So he gives you the regularity to give you something to go on. He's not just throwing everything to the winds because then, then you have nothing. Then, and this, I think, is a fault of some more recent poetry, you know, more right. the last few decades. He realizes the value of that structure, but he also realizes the value of the judicious step away from the structure, right. as with dapple, drawn, drawn, falcon. Just a yeah. Great line. Great phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, can we go through some of this and, and kind of look at the, the annotations and, and kind of eliminate, illuminate some of it? I almost said eliminate. Um, <laughs> illuminate. So, wind, well, we can start with the title, uh, Wind Hover. Well, as I annotate, it's a type of, it's a kestrel, it's a type of falcon. Um, and in particular, it's a falcon, as I note here, which hunts its prey by using the wind to hover above ground, then making a steep dive when the prey is sighted. 
And so from the beginning, he gives us an image of a bird of prey, um, a hunting bird, um, but one that has a very interesting, you know, it, it sort of, well, it hovers, it dances on the wind, it, almost in, as if it were still, but it's still because it's constantly in motion, adjusting to the winds. Hmm. So immediately he gives an image from his observation of the natural environment that sadly is much less accessible to the modern reader than it would have been for his contemporaries who would right. have seen kestrels hovering on walks, for instance, in the countryside, if they were able to do that. We probably see them on nature documentaries. Um, right. But that gives us our first insight that he's choosing this image of a bird of prey and he's dedicating it to Christ our Lord. And yes. then as we go into that, we see that he is actually identifying the bird as an image of Christ, which is just really powerful. Christ is a bird of prey. Interesting. Right. You know, Dauphin might be an unfamiliar word, but, you know, if you're Catholic and you know about the story of Joan of Arc, that might be the one place that you're familiar with it, you know. Or meaning Henry, the, sort of Henry V, that's where I encountered it. <laughs> All the okay, yeah. Shakespeare's Henry V. Yeah, the historically, it's the, as I gloss here, the eldest son of the King of France. So the right. idea of calling him Kingdom of Daylight's Dauphin, he's the Prince of the Kingdom of Heaven, yeah. he's Christ. And dapple, of course, one of his favorite words, meaning kind of what, like uh, an interplay of, of colors mixed together. Yeah, it's in the um, light and shade. Um, yes. So like you're walking through the woods and you see the interplay of light and shade mixed together yeah. on the floor. And of course, from, the kestrel's on... feathers are like kind of a dappled, you know, browns and, and creams. Um, and we have the dawn light. Um, so we have all these these images, this this color and light and movement all in these these opening lines. And and again, that in his riding of the rolling level underneath him, steady air, syntactically a bit weird, but then yeah. the wind hover is hovering over the rolling level, over the rolling hills beneath him on steady air. He is on the air, but he's steady because he's, yeah. he's hovering. So we see him leaving out the preposition here with steady air. Yeah. And that's something that he does a lot. He does. Um, yeah. Also reminding me of Latin, except that we don't have word endings in English to indicate that. Yeah. But you know, he, um, knew, he knew Latin intimately. So this is undoubtedly yeah. an influence on his syntax. Yeah. Um, striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing. Uh, okay. Rung. This is interesting because we know the word ring as a noun uh, meaning a sort of the shape of a ring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but to use it as a verb, I guess there's ring around the rosy. That's maybe that's a maybe that's a verb. But but to use it as a past tense, yeah. that is that really makes you immediately think of a bell, uh, you know, having rung we we or, or or even a rung of a ladder, but not of the the shape of a ring in the past tense of a, you know the verb version of that so you have to think about it a little bit to and and to Hopkins get to is, is well aware of the overlapping associations so the idea that it gives us the connotation of bells ringing is right is in fact a, a level it's a nuance because this is about christ whom we worship in churches that ring bells um, right so this is not a, i think an accidental one um, and he gives us this idea of of the the falcon, you know, circling, ringing around in circles in the air, um, and the rung upon the rain. We might think um, of if you've ever seen horses on a those long reins that they're being, you know, as they go in in circles to be trained. Um, mm -hmm. So rung upon a rain, we can see this. We can see the the wind hover circling as if on an invisible um, leading string, you know, circling around on a wimpling right. wing that that the um folded rippling um wing as you have his feathers rippling as the air catches it and of course as i as i um annotate here wimpling has the additional meaning of with the appearance of a wimple which is the folded right. linen garment that a religious sister would characteristically wear at that time so he's yeah. using wimpling to mean folded but again, he's bringing in a word that has these echoes of, of a religious sensibility because this poem is about Christ. Yes, yes. And um, we see that, uh, you know, we have these descriptions, we get the picture, we have the words that are giving us suggestions of, of Christ. Um, and then possibly my favorite line in this poem, 
My heart in hiding stirred for a bird. My heart in hiding. What an amazing line to think about what it might mean to have our heart be in hiding. Hiding from whom? From Christ, presumably. Mm -hmm. That hidden heart, the, the afraid, the shy, the barricaded heart. The heart is in hiding. And now he speaks, you know, he's speaking in first person. My heart in hiding stirred, stirred for a bird, stirred at the sight of this Christ image. And then yeah. the rest of it just sort of tumbles out as a praise to Christ whom, who has moved him so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, even the use of the word bird is a lot more of a basic word than most of the words he's using there. So it, it, when he says, my heart stirred for a bird, it kind of, um, there's also the sense of surprise that a bird would st be something that would stir your heart. You yeah. Know? Um. Um, yeah. And also, um, yeah, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. So that, again, that's a achieve. We can, we can, we can basically understand what he means there, but it is an unusual uh, approach approach to not say achievement, you know, but just to say achieve. And it, and the way he gives the two phrases, the achieve of uh, the mastery of the thing, you know, you get the sense that the, the poet narrator is at a loss for words. So overwhelmed right. by this moment that he can't quite find the right word. And he's, he's tumbling over his own words to say it, which is such a testament to Hopkins skill, because this is of course, an extremely carefully crafted poem, giving the impression of the poet stumbling for words in, in the midst of it and then i love yes. that the 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 um the sestat those which we have put here very helpfully it, hopkins breaks into the two the two sets of, of three lines there we have that first set of three lines in the sestat where he's just praising beauty beauty and valor and act oh air pride bloom here buckle he's overwhelmed yes. it's all bursting out and it all comes down to him being praising Christ. Everything is just, it's, Christ is so much lovelier, more dangerous. Oh, my chevalier. Oh, my knight. Yes. Thing. Christ is dangerous. Yeah. Well, uh, also that first line, brute beauty and valor and act, oh, air, pride, plume, here, buckle. Uh, that's something that he does a fair amount with that those that succession of strong beats, sort of a listing of things. I, I want to say maybe he does that in. Um, does he do that in Pied Beauty as well? He doesn't. Uh, something other places. something like it's that. Very, yeah, it's a very characteristic um, Hopkins move. And right. there, of course, the the rhythm, the the ambit pentameter is just thrown out the window because you get right, long exactly. succession. But that's the point. He's he's doing it at a, a peak of emotional intensity where mm -hmm. every word gets a stress. Air, pride, bloom, here. That yeah. is the point. Because at this point, it breaks the pattern. It's really meaningful. It's not random. It's not coincidental. It's it's so powerful that it just bursts it open. And then yeah. look at what he does in the very la in the closing lines of it. He eases off. No wonder of it. And the last three lines are very meditative and he changes his image entirely. We've been focusing on the swirling hawk and now we have a plow being drawn through a field. Um, sheer plod, just plodding through the field pulling the plow or going behind the plow pulled by the horse plow it down silly and shine and this is really interesting because again we are a bit detached from an agricultural context that hopkins mm -hmm. and his contemporaries would have been much more familiar with the cilian is the is the furrow made by the plow in the earth that's one of the things i gloss here so mm -hmm. simply plodding through the plow being dragged down through the furrow makes the plow shine. You might think of the claws of a bird here. Uh, you know, the, 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 the plow uh, making ruts in the earth, like the, the claws of a bird, if it would po get raked with the, you, you know what I mean? Possibly. Um, but I think his, his emphasis here is on the way, because sheer plod makes plow shine. He shifted his image, yeah. so now he's got the, the the perhaps rusty old plow by the very act of being dragged through the soil. It's cleaning off the rust. That that right. laborious thing is making it shine, and so that's one image. 
And now he shifts to a totally different image. Blue bleak embers, so uh, coals in the fire, fall, they gall themselves, and I gloss that, injure themselves, wound themselves, in other words, break open. If you've ever right. seen a fire in a fireplace, you have these sort of gray, ashy, dull coal, falls, breaks open, and inside, gold vermilion. Yeah. And what's inside the ashy core? Beauty. It has to be right. broken. How do we make the plow to be shining and sharp? By b- pulling it through the earth, by making these gashes. Right. So we have this this hint of what he means in ordinary life then of yes the danger yes yes yeah um yeah well um one other question then um we see these accent marks the third to last line of the poem and that's something that's going to return in some of these other poems so maybe you can tell us about why he uses these accent marks he uses some of them to in to give a little bit of help to the reader about where he really wants the emphasis to go so there he really wants to see that we need to put a stress on both of those so we have returned back to more or less normal iambic metameter except he wants you to see its sheer plod emphasis on both you know as an annotator it was tricky to know what to do with the accent marks because he is inconsistent and highly variable in what he did in his manuscripts and so all editors have to decide to what extent do we reproduce the accent marks in the in the published poems i have put relatively few and usually only ones that are very widely reproduced so that people would wonder if they weren't there Um, some editions of his poems will give much more extensive markings where the whole page is just scattered with with accent marks because he's really marking them up heavily um, mm-hmm. I decided to take a bit of a middle ground where I didn't do that, but I included them in certain of the poems where he would otherwise was not marking it up, but put a couple in because he, he clearly felt that, no, no, I really want the reader to see the emphasis goes there. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Anything more to say about this poem or should we move no, on? No, I to think we can, we can move another on. Another one. Okay. So, I mean, that gives people a good introduction to a lot of his stylistic traits and the kind of language that he uses. Um, so let's do carry and comfort. Let me find that. Oddly enough, this also is another of my favorites, although it's one of his, um, what are sometimes called the terrible sonnets, but I prefer to call them the sonnets of desolation. Um, Mm -hmm. because they are, they're very dark. They're very dark sonnets. Um, they have to do with, um, just agony, spiritual, mental, emotional agony. Mm-hmm. And Hopkins certainly was a depressive. Um, he, he, he definitely had personal experience of, of depression. This is, I think, abundantly clear from, from his life, from his writings, from his poetry. But mm-hmm. we should not take the Sonnets of Desolation to be purely autobiographical. So right. A lot of people do, including a lot of critics, and that's not, that's not accurate because he was a, a poet and he's imagining himself into these emotional states as well as expressing his emotional states. And right. some of the some of the poems, I, I note this in the annotations and in, in the introduction, some of the terrible sonnets um, come actually from his engagement with the Jesuits um, spiritual exercises where he's imagining himself into what would it be like to be among the damned? What would it be like to be so alienated from God? Okay, that's what it'd be like. Oh, it's pretty terrible. <laughs> and then he writes a mm. poem out of that. You know, and that, and as with, you know, a poem like Carrying Comfort, clearly he is drawing on his own emotional suffering. It's so clear that he knows what he's talking about. But mm. I think he's being an artist with it. This is not simply a cry de cour. It's it is a a poem. Um a work, a work of art. And I think that that makes it more accessible because he is sharing something of himself, but he's he's not just gushing on the page and therefore we can engage with it and, and share in it. Right. So can you explain the title before reading the poem? Right. So yes, Carrion Comfort, and I, and I gloss this in my annotations, Carrion is dead and rotting flesh, usually of an animal. And so carrying comfort is therefore false and corrupting comfort. So despair is trying to offer a kind of comfort, but it's a corrupted kind of comfort. It's carrying Mm -hmm. comfort. And I think that idea that despair could be comforting under certain 
emotional conditions is tremendously insightful on Hopkins' part because there are mm -hmm. states of mind in which despair is a comfort. Mm -hmm. And he gets that and he writes this poem, I think, out of that. So let me read right. Carry and Comfort. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee, not untwist, slack they may be, these last strands of man and me, or most weary cry, I can no more. I can. Can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be? But ah, but O oh, thou terrible, why wouldst thou rood on me, thy ring world right foot rock, lay a lion limb against me? Scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan, oh, in turns of tempest, me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear. Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since seems, I kissed the rod, hand rather, my heart, lo, lapped strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven-handling flung me, foot-trod me? Or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year, of now done darkness, I, wretch, lay wrestling with, my, my God, my God. So that is Carrying Comfort, possibly, in my view, one of the most powerful poems that Hopkins ever wrote. Hmm. Can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be? So there, um, let's pause there for a moment. He set yeah. the stage really beautifully because the whole first set of lines is all negations. It's an affirmation of life phrased right. entirely in negative terms. I'm not going to feast into pair, despair. I'm not right. going to undo the last strands of myself. I'm not going to say I can't go on. And that last one, I'm not going to choose not to be. In other words, I'm not going to kill myself. Hmm. So, so far yeah. we've seen he's hanging on, but by his fingernails. Right. But now we get a sort of complaint. But ah, but oh, thou terrible. And um, here we shift to who he's addressing, because first yes. he's addressing despair. Um, but when he switches to, oh, thou terrible, he is addressing God. And mm -hmm. it's quite the robust complaint. You, you terrible, why, why would you do this to me? And here the language becomes intensely fragmented. And yes. here we can see again that that intensity of emotion, as it were, breaking it open um, and inverting the syntax. So rude is diff is a means roughly. It doesn't mean yeah. It means roughly, which was more yeah. common in Hopkins' time. He wasn't being deliberately obscure. Right. So why would you roughly put your right foot on me? Your yeah. and ring world is a Hopkins invention. It's what an interesting phrase, ring world, to ring out something. Like if you ring out a dish rag, is to twist it until everything runs out of it. So the idea of God as a ring world kind of person, like it's that's a powerful image of God is like, you're squeezing everything out of me, God. Why are you doing this to yeah. me? And it's a word that sounds, uh, you know, ring. It does sound like it. it's meaning because the W and R kind of put together, if you want to really make that clear reading it out loud, that you're not talking about R-I-N-G, you have to kind of do something to it. Um, and uh, yeah, the, it feels like the the R sound in general is like the sound of frustration. So it's a very, very, appropriate, you know, yeah, it's a very appropriate for him to use. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very appropriate. Uh, um, yes, very interesting. And Lay a you, lion limb against me. And of course, you know, we, the idea of the image of, of Christ as the lion of Judah um, for right. Hopkins. Well, for us, we might say Christ as Aslan. The idea of Christ as a lion is very powerful. Um, yeah. And and I think it's interesting to make this is a connection, obviously, that is anachronistic for Hopkins, but relevant for us, because C.S. Lewis picks up the image of Christ as the lion and making Aslan on the Chronicles of Narnia. Right. And he makes a 
point in the Narnia Chronicles of saying that Aslan is not safe. He's not safe. Right. He's good, but he's not safe. And that right. is a very, that's um, you know, very commonly quoted bit. But sometimes I think it's so often quoted, people lose the point of it. He's not safe means he is scary. Mm -hmm. Christ the lion is, is scary. Now he's also good as we find out, but he's not safe. And right. here we see that same kind of idea. You know, oh, why would you lay a lion limb against me? You're lying down next to me and I don't like it. It's scary. Um, why are you looking at me with darksome devouring eyes? Why are you scanning me? Why are you looking at me with these eyes? Uh, so this yeah. this encounter with Christ is very refreshing because it gives us this potency. We we don't have a nice you know buddy Jesus here. We have right. Christ the Lord who is pretty intimidating, um, and yet Hopkins is able to speak to him directly. He has a fearlessness in his faith that I think is so important. He shows he's he's not afraid to show how frightening God can be, but he's mm -hmm. also at the very same moment speaking directly to God, saying, "Why are you doing this? Um, why yeah. are you fanning with turns of tempest? Why are you sending your winds to blow over me with me frantic to avoid thee and flee? God, I'm trying yeah. to run away from you. Why are you coming after me?" That's <laughs> so what we get yeah. in that first stanza. Yeah. Uh, why that my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear, and that sheer and clear, even in the, again in the sounds, it's like the first opening up of of things. Mm. You know, there's like a relief there, yeah, and kind the of like a, a joy clear and clear. Yeah, even just reading, yeah. you feel like you can breathe again. Um, and of course, anyway, I, I gloss this um, because again, this would have been something more accessible to Hopkins and less to us. How do we get grain? How do we get bread? The, the, the wheat has to be beaten so that the, the inedible chaff will be knocked off and the nutritious grains will be available. Right. Now, this is a pretty rough process for the wheat. It gets beaten yeah. by flails. <laughs> um, yes. And so well, it's interesting because it's a very biblical image, but um, Christ uses it, use it more in terms of separating uh, the good people from the bad people. Whereas in, in this, he's separating the good and the as bad aspects of himself. Yeah. So again, um, it's a very, it's a, yeah, it's a very deeply scriptural image. Um, yeah. And so he's, he's appropriating that in the best possible way and saying within my own heart, there is chaff that needs to be removed so that my grain can lie sheer and clear that I can be, you know, the good seed, um, and now with that recognition that there's a purpose for all this tumult um, and even the tempest, because once you've beaten the chaff, it needs to be there needs to be fanned so the chaff will blow away. So the tempest in the earlier stanza that was so troubling him, he's now realizing it's right. so that my chaff might fly. It's to blow away all that is not good, all that is not fruitful. Yeah, but then after sheer and clear, we get toil and coil, which again, the sa just the way you have to do with your mouth to pronounce those vowels, it's a different feeling than than sheer and clear. Um, since seems, I kissed the rod hand rather. So what is that seems, that paren parenthetical seems? Well, I love, I love that because he's, he's moving in this poem gradually. He's moving towards an affirmation that God has been working in him for good. Um, but he's too honest. This poet narrator is too honest to to give us just the pious affirmation, because to say you know that I kiss the rod would be to say I acknowledge the symbol of authority. I acknowledge the flailing rod that is doing this. But but he's not entirely sure that he has fully accepted that authority. Since seems I kiss the rod, there's still that little bit of well maybe I'm a work in progress. I love that sense of of honesty because how many of us can truly say at any given moment yes i am completely obedient 100 percent yeah no there's probably some corner of our heart where we have to say well seems yes um and we're gonna get rod and trod in this poem just as we get in god's grandeur um interestingly hand rather um, and here it's interesting because now we're shifting because the whole poem is a process. We're shifting from this image of God as frightening, distant, tempest to, okay, authority figure that I accept with the rod. But then he corrects himself 
hand, which is personal, not the rod, but the hand that holds it. So now it's become more relational, more intimate, more personal. And then he talks about his, his emotional reaction. My heart, lo, that archaic exclamation, lo, behold. And his, his imagery here is so neat. Lapped strength, as if he's a kitten lapping at a little saucer of milk. Lapped strength, stole joy. Is he allowed to have joy? He steals some joy? Would, would doesn't say he did laugh, would, would laugh, would cheer. And again, the psychological and emotional and spiritual realism of this, he has had this recognition that God has put him through this for good, but does he bound up full of vim and vigor? No, he's weak as a kitten. He's barely kind of tentatively inching towards possibly having some joy. Yeah. Very realistic. Yeah. And cheer is interesting as a verb because it's like, well, it, we, we, I suppose you could cheer yourself. You could cheer, you could cheer at something. Um, you know, you could cheer yourself up. You could cheer someone, give someone cheer, you know? Um, but I, I think it's, I think, um, the subsequent line indicates that it's the sense of cheering someone and in, in, uh, applauding them in that sense. Right. But again, the multiplicity of meaning is not coincidental because it's right. cheer is paired with laugh. So that sense of cheerfulness right. is, is there. Right, but then, exactly. But then he moves, because he says, would laugh, cheer. And the immediate question he asks, cheer whom? Who am I cheering? Right. Who am I cheering for? Yeah. And then he's not sure. Yeah. Um, the hero, you could almost say like, somebody might use that ironically. You know, the hero who's heavenly, who's heaven handling flung me, foot trod me. Or me that fought him, that also doesn't sound uh, <laughs> sound great uh, like a thing to cheer. Oh, uh, which one is it? Each one. And let's, let's pause on that for just a second because we have in that the idea of the hero. Of course, that's Christ, uh, and there yeah. is, I think, a touch of sort of self-deprecating irony. Am I cheering the one who flung me around and trodden me? Well, yeah, I guess yeah. I am. And then also he's saying, "Am I cheering myself who fought him?" And I think that this is a, is sort of at an arm's length allusion to Jacob wrestling with the angel. Um, mm -hmm. is we, okay. we do have the sense in scripture of the merits of wrestling with God. Um, and Jacob right. is rewarded by that. Um, he wrestles with the angel all night um, and he is rewarded. So, yeah. Oh, which, which, would, which would fit with the, the type of action described in the first several lines in that it is – his right foot is on him. Is he laying a limb against him? His bruised bones. He's not being cut. He's not being stabbed. These are wrestling type, you know, yeah. moves that I are think being underscoring used. the whole thing. There yeah. is that sense. It's a Jacob and the angel. It's that sort of undercurrent, scriptural undercurrent to this whole poem. Um, right. Now you don't need to recognize that to to grasp the poem, but it's. I think it's something that Hopkins is doing, um, right. and that helps us understand how he can say. Maybe it is each one. Maybe I do get to cheer yeah. myself. Um, yeah. And then I just love what he does in that last sentence, the last line and a half. That night, that year, um, even in that, he starts to say in that night of darkness. No, nope, let's be honest. It wasn't just a passing night. That year right. of darkness. But that also plays on the two meanings of night that the spirit in the Catholic spiritual tradition, the, the word night, you know, doesn't refer to the sp a, a sp specific span of time, you know. Yeah. And he's really underscoring yeah. that, um, you know, this was a this was a whole time for him. It didn't pass right. easily. It didn't pass quickly. But at this point, it's now done darkness. Yes. And we started at the bleakest part where all he can do is say, well, I won't kill myself. But now as we've moved through this, we're finally at the point we can look back and say, this darkness has passed, now done darkness. Yeah. And then he recognizes what has been happening all along. I, wretch, yeah. lay wrestling with, and I love that parenthetical exclamation because we get the sense that he's realizing at the moment, I was wrestling with God. My God, I was wrestling with God. It's this yeah. astonishment at realizing what god has been doing in all of this suffering mm -hmm. 
Yeah, great, great. Okay, well, um, got a couple more to do here. Um, we could do patience. Perhaps we'll do that one a little bit more quickly because I want to make sure we have time for. Uh... Sure. Yeah, and this is this isn't as difficult. This one, um, perhaps as the wind hover, um, but it still has a few things to. Uh, yeah. So go ahead and read this that one, one if you would. Patience, and again another sonnet in the Italian form. So um, we have. The, the initial um, octave, the initial eight lines, it sets up the situation, and then the, the following six lines that sort of resolves or, or comments on the situation. That's a structure that Hopkins uses a lot. It's a very mm -hmm. fruitful structure. So, patience. Patience, hard thing. The hard thing but to pray, but bid for patiences. Patience who asks, wants war, wants wounds, weary his times, his tasks. To do without, take tosses, and obey. Rare patience roots in these, and these away, nowhere. Natural heart's ivy, patience masks our ruins of wrecked past purpose. There she basks, purple eyes and seas of liquid leaves all day. We hear our hearts great on themselves, it kills to bruise them dearer. Yet the rebellious wills of us, we do bid God bend to him even so. And where is he who more and more distills delicious kindness? He is patient. Patience fills his crisp combs, and that comes the way those ways we know. So in this one, the words he's using are, are pretty normal, but it's more the syntax and kind of the the, the way that he uses the words that can be tricky. Yeah, this is one of his more elliptical poems, I think. Right. Um, he hasn't invented anything, um, but he's leaving out an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, even that first sentence, you know, well, patience, hard thing. He's leaving out the verse. Patience is a hard thing. The hard thing is but to pray. Um, yeah. And I think... The hard thing but to pray, but bid for... He, and and then the second he even leaves out the two, but to pray, but bid for. Yeah, and patience is reverses it. This is one of his more difficult syntax lines. And bid for means to ask for. It's right. the hard thing is to pray, but to ask for um, is hard to pray. It's hard to ask for patience, but we can ask for patience. Um, right, and and uh, the way I read it is that even just but to. Uh, even just to pray and ask for patience is hard. Yeah. But you can also say the hard, you can also say that's what patience is in a way. And you can you also know. say that, um, that it may be hard, but you can ask for patience to do the praying. Um, okay. So it's interesting because, huh. because he has left out all these verbs, it has, right. it has rendered the lines in some senses ambiguous in the sense that we can read right. it multiple ways but it's not infinitely ambiguous. Whatever right. whatever way we're framing it. It's the relation that's ambiguous. Yeah, exactly. So clearly he's trying, he's, he's giving us the opportunity to kind of meditate on these interconnections between patience and prayer and how hard it is. Is it a, simply a one way thing? It's hard to pray, ask for patience. Right. Well, it's a little more complicated than that maybe. Maybe we need to pray for patience to ask for help in prayer. Right, and, that, and, and patience who asks that inversion there, because the most obvious meaning you could say is the person who asks for patience, but patience who asks again makes it ambiguous as if, is it patience asking, you know, that that kind of thing, wants war, wants wounds. So, and then you talk about that the meaning of want in that uh, annotation there as well. Yeah. And that's a, it's a very interesting poem in the way that he's, he's making these fairly ordinary words do double or triple duty because wants means desires. And it also means a slightly less common use of the day lacks. We see that in mm -hmm. the, in the translation of the Psalm, um, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. There's nothing I shall lack. So it's those, both of those meanings are working here. So patience is desiring the one who's asking for patience desires war and wounds. He wants something exciting to happen. 
he doesn't want to just deal with his weary times, his tasks to do without right. the tosses and obey. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to have war and wounds that are more exciting. Yeah. And more. But at the same time, it lacks patience, doesn't have war, doesn't have wounds. It is his task to be taking tosses and obeying. Yeah. So it's that simultaneous, I want these things, I don't have them, and they're both part of the meaning of what it is to try to learn to be patient. Yeah, interesting. I had another thought, and I, I don't know if you can really interpret it this way, but another thought that I had is that people who are asking for growth in patience may even ask God for opportunities to grow in patience, which would mean you know, war and wounds and <laughs> those things that that would be difficult. But yeah. but really, we might want those. We we, we may often uh, people of a certain disposition might ask for these uh, heroic ways of growing. And actually, what they're supposed to do is just deal with the humble uh, moment in which they live. And I think that is very much in line with what Hopkins is saying here. And remember, he had a very boring life in many respects. Yeah. Um, his his. You know, he might have wanted war and wanted wounds, but he had to grade examination papers. <laughs> right. And that was something he was grappling with. Um, and then he says rare patience. And he, and here again, we have a double meaning that I gloss here. Rare, as I say, means infrequent and exceptional. So it's hard to do this, he's saying. But rare mm -hmm. also means especially valuable and precious. Right. Both of those things are simultaneously being evoked when he says rare patience roots in these roots in these ordinary things and these away nowhere. Um, and this is one of his, again, very condensed elliptical lines, which I gloss to be if these conditions, the wearying circumstances that we've seen, if these conditions are absent, then true patience cannot grow here. These away right. nowhere. We can't be patient unless we have things to be patient about, is what he's getting at. And now here's the first real imagery we get in the poem. Natural height, natural heart's ivy, patience masks are ruins of wrecked past purpose. So we can see how a ruined building might look nicer covered in ivy. Yeah. Um, and and it's There she basks purple eyes and seas of liquid leaves all day. And I didn't understand that line until I had spent time in, in Oxford, where I have seen that exact thing. Perhaps even the answer, the, the descendants of the ivy that Hopkins saw as he walked in Oxford mm -hmm. as a student. Because ivy, English ivy, when it grows over a building, it, it can be tremendous. It grows over an entire wall. It makes a sea of liquid leaves. So if the wind rustles through it, it really does look like a rippling green sea. Mm. And the berries that it makes um, are purple. There are these round berries. So the, that is actually a very vividly accurate description of English ivy covering a ruined wall. Purple eyes and seas of liquid leaves. It is astonishingly like strange, but it's beautifully accurate. That's what it looks like. And right. it does so, cover over these ruins. Yeah, and wrecked past purpose, specifically talking about one's plans or expectations for one's life, really. Yeah. Um, or past failures, you know, anything that anything yeah. that you wish were different and it's not. Um, patience just grows over. It covers it over. Um, yeah. The, those things are still there. And again, we have Hopkins' spiritual realism. The ruins are still there. They haven't gone away, but patience is covering them over. Um, and giving a sort of a, a life to it that it didn't have before. Yeah. Um, we hear our hearts grate on themselves. It kills to bruise them dearer. What does it mean to bruise something dearer? Um, dearer would mean um, more like more intimately, um, like the okay. phrase near and dear. Um, yeah. Okay. So it, we, we have this sense that he is moving for like, okay, I'm, I'm attempting to be patient I'm, my heart is grating on itself. It's difficult to do this. Er, we can almost hear the nails on chalkboard of like, I'm trying to be right. patient. I'm trying to be obedient. And so I'm trying, Lord, and I have to do it even more. So this sense of this sense of I'm being asked to do something even harder. I, I, I don't want to 
be more patient. I don't want to accept more than I already am doing. It kills to bruise them dearer. And then in that next line, we have a really, I think, very mature spiritual insight here that it feels so painful. It kills. Yet the rebellious wills of us, we do bid God bend to him even so. And I gloss this by re rearranging the syntax. Nevertheless, we do ask God to bend, that is to subdue our rebellious wills to him, even though it hurts. Why do you think he says of us instead of our? Is that just for, for rhythm or is there anything else going on there? Um, I think for once, I think Hopkins is deliberately inviting the reader into the poem with him. He doesn't do it very often, um, but I think he's doing it here. I think he's inviting the reader to step in with him and say, we are all in this together. We are trying to do this. You reader and I, right. poet, same problem. But why does he say of us instead of our rebellious wills? Uh, I it's think, just kind of an unusual. Well, I think because um, if he, the way he does it, say yet the rebellious wills of us puts such an emphasis on rebellious wills that it highlights okay. that. If we said yet our rebellious wills, it would move rebellious wills slightly out of the, the prime place. He really wants okay. to call our attention to rebellious wills. We've got rebellious wills. They're ours. Uh -huh. These okay. we do, we do ask God to bend these right. wills to him, even so. And where is he who more and more distills delicious kindness? He is patient. Patience fills his crisp, crisp combs, and that comes those ways we know. Um, interesting that he uses where. Where is he? And the answer is he is patient. So we're not talking about a place exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting. He's almost shifting time and space and in there. And I think that's almost part of the point. Where right. Where is he? Well, we see him in anyone who is being patient. Um, it's not a place. It's a condition. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, crisp combs, honeycombs, you annotate that. So we get that, that delicious kindness, then immediately gets, a, again, a, a, and also a scriptural image, this idea of the sweetness right. of honey. Um, we've had quite a tough poem, you know, our hearts grating in ourselves, ruins of wrecked past purpose. But he's saying there's, a, this is not just all about bending our wills and suffering and bowing down. No, no, we do this. And what do we get? We get delicious kindness. We get the sweetness of honey. There's a sweetness at the end of it. And that lovely, gentle closing phrase. And that comes those ways we know. We know how to do this. This is not right. rocket science. <laughs> we know. Yes, it does feel uh, that last line that comes those ways we know. It feels a little bit like an ad admonition of someone who is, who is looking any – any other way to grow patience than actually having to go through the the grind of it you know well you know <laughs> like uh yeah because because that's often the case we often we often know well you know what the best way is but we're just looking for a shortcut yeah and uh, that, again that's hopkins utter down to earthness his spiritual realism and honesty yeah i i know how to be patient i just don't want to i don't want to do it but that's it comes those ways we know we know them. Yeah. Just do them. Ah, patience, hard thing. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So let's let's do one more. The title poem, as kingfishers catch fire, and we've got another bird here. Uh, we do, and I'm glad. I, I'm glad we're closing with this one. As as you've noted, this um is the poem that I chose to give the title to the uh to the whole. Poem. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Um. I think in a way the kingfisher is almost the emblematic or iconic Hopkins bird because the kingfisher, um, it's a small, very brightly colored bird. It's very active. It's mobile. Um, it's a very English bird. He would have seen them hmm. walking the streams and the countryside. Um, and that combination of, of brilliant color um, and fast motion is so Hopkinian, if you can invent that word, that's a terrible word. So, so Hopkins like in in that image and i think this poem um conveys a, a lot of hopkins to sort of essential essential qualities it's almost the iconic hopkins poem in in my mind hmm. um okay and and that's why the the um i don't know if you noticed but the cover 
um, colors are kingfisher covers colors. So there's the oh, nice. turquoise and then the inner russet. Those are kingfisher colors. So the book nice. has been, uh, yes. So if, and if you open yes. it up, you can see the russet inside of the, no, oh, they open up the, I should do that. Oh, I see. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Russet and turquoise for the kingfisher. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm actually show people the book because it's, it's quite nice. And it, uh, as you note in the introduction has a lot of margin space. For making your own notes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we should have. I should have done this before. So yes, you can see here. This is what annotations look like. Um, a whole whole page of them facing off to to the poems. Right. So as kingfishers catch fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that, being indoors, each one dwells, selves, goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ, for Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. Um, I noticed the, the, um, some of the accents in here, like on I Say More, the just man justice is, um uh it's it's not it's nothing out of the ordinary he's just making it clear because it's a an iambic pentameter line and uh and there's the first um uh what do you call it the first beat not the first beat um whatever the first syllable mm -hmm. is 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 missing and so it's just making it clear that that you're starting on the first strong uh syllable there in the poem so you know somebody even without those accents you could you could gather that if you're familiar with iambic pentameter, but it's it's useful that he puts those in. And then there's some others where maybe it's it's you wouldn't know unless he put the accent. But yeah, I think um, he's and this is why I left these in for for this one because he's he's clearly in this poem just adding a little bit of extra clarity um, to make sure that we're getting the emphasis. Like in that the last line of the uh, the octave, crying, "What I do is me," um, because you crying could be two syllables but he's sort of aligning that to one crying what i do is me yeah and that's important right, right. for expressing a key meaning of this poem what i do is me the way that i act expresses who i am um yeah and we get that in the second the second half you know the just man he, he, he's verbing a noun here again the just man justices i love that what do you do if you're a just man you justice, yeah. Um, uh, keeps grace. So that this idea of identity—that's what this poem is all about. It is about what it means to have identity in Christ, and it begins not with human beings, but with all creation. And that's right. so beautiful because everything, everything is created by God, and He glories in it. And as kingfishers catch fire. That line, that image of a, of a, you know, a turquoise and golden and russet kingfisher kind of flashing fire as he goes through the sunlit air to dive down to catch a fish. As kingfishers catch fire and dragonflies draw flame, you know, these, these little darting flame-like dragonflies. Mm -hmm. So we get bird world, insect world, and then the musicality as picture now he's dropping a stone into a well as tumbled over rim in roundy wells stones ring you can almost hear the echo of the stone tumbling down through the well mm -hmm. uh, and then a bell and this is particularly interesting and i glossed this um in my my edition um so a, a I see, he says, a hung bell's bow swung. If you don't know about how bells are put in towers, this might be confusing. But as I mm -hmm. annotated, a church bell is hung or placed in a frame and then swung to make it ring. 
and the part of the bell where the clapper strikes to make a noise is called the sound ring or the sound bow. So he's using some <clears throat> bell terminology here. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when he talks about the bell fling out its name, there's a medieval Catholic tradition, um, I think it's often still done. Um, well, in Notre Dame, I remember they replaced the bells a few years ago and they they there was a post online where they described the names of the different bells. Exactly. The so the bells have names. Them. And they're even said to have um, been called baptizing them. You know, the blessing of the uh, the the um, the blessing of the bells, um, which you know, with holy water and, and prayers. It's it's a kind of you know a kind of baptism for this for this sacramental object. So the idea of the bell ringing out his name specifically has a really sacramental connotation for Hopkins. Not just any old bell. We had the idea of a, of a bell that has been blessed for the service of the worship of God. Mm -hmm. So each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. And yeah. that musicality hung, swung, tongue. And then we've got, yeah. you know, name, same. We got all so much rhyme internally and externally in these lines. So musical. And he already used the word ring about the stones, so he doesn't need to use that again about the bells. Exactly. It's almost like it's still resonating in our imagination. The stone is ringing, right. and so we already have that ringing in our ears as we get to the bell um, flinging out broad its name. And then he says what this all means. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out, this is one of his more difficult lines, deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. That means it it shows forth, it deals out, like you're dealing a pack of cards, it shows out yeah. what inside of itself, indoors, is in it. What is in it? Um, um, would this be a good place to mention this this inscape idea? Is that sort of connected to this? I mean, it is. I mean, Hopkins, again, this is an area that this we could talk a lot about. Um, but Hopkins had an, a sense that everything had a kind of essence, what he called inscape. Um, it's sort of, it's isness, um, you know, the, the bellness of a bell or the kingfisherness of a, of a kingfisher. And he felt that it was possible to express this in a poem we call it inscape. Is, is, is there any difference between inscape and the sort of the, the, the classical um, notion of, you know, quiddity or wh whatever you might call it, the essence of a thing? Is there He's any other from... uh, connotation that, that that has? Or is he basically just using another word for the same thing? Um, I think... I am not sufficiently versed in, in the theology of it to be able to give you a definitive answer. Um, Do you think Inscape has a, more of a connection to the way that we experience things, the way that we intuit the being of something? Maybe? Yes, I think because I think what he's doing is it's definitely it, we know for a fact it's rooted in that theology, the idea of quiddity. That's where he gets it. right. Um, but right. I think what's making it distinctive for Hopkins, and I speak not as a theologian, but as a literary critic, I think that he's sort of translating that into into his activity as as a poet. You know, a poet. because Scape does have a kind of a visual, almost kind of connotation. Yeah, to it. and he's trying to figure out how do I communicate that. You know, it's all very well to be right. philosophizing about what is the quiddity of something, but how do I show that in a poem? Um, and that really right. is what he takes as his his task. How do I okay. convey the inscape of something um, in, yeah. in a poem? Now he uses self as a verb, selves as a verb. Now I, I don't, I, I feel like there's another poem in which he does that as well. I could be misremembering, but um, yeah, I actually gloss it. It's um, that nature is a Heraclitian fire and of the comfort of the resurrection. Yeah, okay, right. Um, he calls man, he calls the clearest selved spark. Um, right. So this idea of, of a human being as selving, as being itself, um, is is part of Hopkins's thought. This is part of what it means to be fully human, is to be yourself, to be human. Um, and of course, for Hopkins, that does not mean just do whatever you feel like, because to fully be yourself would be fully to be one with Christ. So yeah. you are being what you are meant to be, that is what it means to be yourself truly. Um, right. What I do to me, for that I came, for that is what I was made for. I was made to be who I am. When, when he says goes itself, um, that makes me think of a kind of like a, a childlike language or a colloquial language that 
when we talk about something going something in the sense of making a certain sound like uh, because we do say go and he 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 goes and you know when we're talking about something someone's saying something yeah right? i think that, i don't know if that's what he's getting at there or if that so, was him because i think okay. that is an american idiom okay um so i i don't i don't think that is what he's getting at there um but i think he's trying to convey this idea of motion um it's okay it's going and it's movement it is it is itself but i think you're right there is a kind of a childlike simplicity there it, it goes it it moves it is itself it speaks right. and spells that kind of childhood language of the of the you know the, the childhood reading it speaks and spells right yeah and also deals out that being that's another interesting very kind of almost casual sounding way of thinking of like a card game or yeah. <laughs> or something you it's know it's unexpected um, and that's that's what yeah. the fresh thing of a Hopkins Hill you have these you know the, these very sort of solemn associations the church bell and then he gives you an image that evokes like you know some people playing cards but it's yeah. fresh like oh well yeah right this is what is this is an image that conveys what it means to be myself right and then having given yeah. us these pictures of it um then he moves I say more and then and then he says more he elaborates on it on the way that this connects to to Christ what do you think he's doing there when he uh, you can always as a poet say more without saying you're saying more so what is the what is the what's the value of I say more he kind of this move that he makes there um uh, well that's an interesting question uh, I don't I don't know um it is always entirely possible that it's mainly I mean, it, <laughs> it does draw i mean it does draw attention you know like, like listen to what i'm going to say in that kind of sense yeah i mean but, he is uh, making sure that he that we see the emphasis on the eye so he is he is now speaking as the poet narrator um right so i think he, he may we he may well be just calling our attention to say listen up like in the beginning of Beowulf, white listen up i say more listen to me well this is Okay, so maybe he wasn't thinking about this at all, but he's just been talking about what these other things say, what they speak and spell, and what they're speaking and spelling is themselves. Now, what he's doing as a poet and as a human being is he is describing other things and saying what they are. So you could take it as, well, now as a man, I can say more than they can say. They can only say themselves, but I can actually give them names. I can say what other people do. That kind of thing. Maybe there's something of that. That's beautiful. You know what, Thomas? That that is a new insight for me into this poem. Um, and this just goes to the show the value of of talking about poetry with people who are interested. Please do this, readers. Do this with this book. I think that's a really beautiful insight, and it ties Thanks. in too to his poetic vocation, because what is what is he right. particularly charged to do? Not just as a human being, Adam naming the creatures, but as him, Gerard Manley Hopkins, poet he is charged to say more that is what he is doing in this very poem he is saying right. more and he's helping us to see what it is that uh that he's doing um thank you i am going to now use this, one to talk oh, about thank this you. poem. so when he says keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces um is that grace great great key or or it's explaining what what it means to keep grace well i think he's talking about what it means to be now living sacramentally because now he's moved from the bigger picture of the natural world to saying what does the just man do um and mm -hmm. you know the just man is the one who has the mind of christ um so he right. keeps grace he keeps in grace he, he's in communion with god he is in a state of grace and that condition keeps all his goings graces so by being in grace by keeping grace therefore his actions are full of grace notice how he emphasizes that stress that he keeps grace he's he's staying in that state and that that staying in that state of grace keeps or ensures all of his goings all of his actions are graces and so therefore every, because he is keeping grace He's extending grace then to all with whom he comes in contact. And we see that in the next sentence. He acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. So insofar as we are in grace, we are in Christ, and we are therefore acting as Christ in the world in 10,000 places. Yeah. Yes, interesting. Um, 
I, I wonder, is he, uh, is he, that's also the saying more that he is doing, I think, yeah. is when he's bringing Christ into it. And I think what we can, to some extent, apply that even back to the natural uh, animals and other phenomena that he discusses in the first stanza, even though he's specifying through the features of men's faces as the most exalted way in which this happens. In, yeah, and he's aware which... of God's presence in, in every creative thing. He's very aware of, right. of that. Um, but there's a special way, of course, in which each of us human yeah. beings is is united with Christ. Um, right. And that's, I think, what he's he's getting at. We have this lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. So now we're seeing yeah. that these other people, they're they're not Christ's physical body. These are these are yeah. individuals, but they are lovely to the Father through the features of men's faces. So insofar as all of these people are in Christ, and of course, man, he's using here in the sense of human being. He's not just talking about male human beings. Yeah. All human beings are lovely to God because they're made in the image of Christ. Um, so all yeah. of them are lovely to the Father. So I think when he says, I say more with the accent on both I and more, we can look at it, uh, the more being most importantly, seeing Christ and he's seeing more in these things than these things are necessarily making obvious about themselves. But also that he also what I said before about he as the poet and he as the human being. Yeah, it's all these things uh, at the same time. So this, and of yeah. course, we see this then that he has moved us from beauty of the natural world that we reflect in it. Anybody can see um, if they've got eyes open that the kingfisher is beautiful. Um, yeah. And he moves from that to a sort of inner vision. Um, you know, I mean, he, remember he worked in the slums of Liverpool and Birmingham. So he saw mm. Christ in the faces of the poor who would not have right. been outwardly beautiful. Um, but he's saying that these two are lovely to the father. Um, yeah. and so he's moving us from the easily accessible beauty to the more hidden beauty, um, through the, through the course of the arc of this poem. Well, great. Um, well, this was great. And I mean, like you said, a discussion always brings out more things, more thoughts than I would have had. Not only do you get to benefit from the thoughts of the other person you're discussing with, but you also, you seem, things seem to happen, you know, that when I'm just sort of staring at the page by myself, don't, don't necessarily happen. And that's so. what I really hope that this volume makes accessible because it has the annotations. I hope it takes away some of the fear factor. Um, so the people who you know, are interested in doing a reading group, you know, something like that could get together and you know, they've got a guide to go through it. And so you can start to tackle the poems and discuss them, knowing that you have a scaffolding that's going to keep you on track as to the meaning of the words. And therefore, you can more comfortably engage and discuss and, and apply what, you know, what insights does this give into my spiritual life, knowing that you're doing it within what Hopkins intends. And I think that right. will give people confidence to read these poems, um, to reflect on them, to discuss them. I mean, they, Hopkins has been a joy in my life for, you know, for 30 years. And I, I would love everyone, you know, who loves poetry or even who is mildly interested in poetry to have something of that same beautiful experience. Well, Holly, thank you very much for, for coming on once again. My pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Glad to be on. Yeah, this was fun. And so again, yes, uh, the book is called As Kingfishers Catch Fire, Selected and Annotated Poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins. I'll link to that at Word on Fire in the show notes for this episode for people to order if they wish. And uh, yeah, so before too long, you'll be coming back on, I hope, uh, to talk about this exciting uh, spiritual biography of Tolkien. Yes, very excited about that. Tolkien's faith, a spiritual biography, exactly what it says in the title. It's a full biography of Tolkien's life, tracing his his growth um, in his spiritual life, his growth as a, as a Christian, as a Catholic. And no, no book like this exists, shockingly. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mentioned this before we started recording, but on I think in our, the previous interview, we were talking about what sort of books about Tolkien do we need that are sort of lacking in the, the Tolkien scholarship landscape. And and I know I, you mentioned two or three things, but I know that one of them was a biography, a new biography, because we were talking about the limitations of Humphrey Carpenter's uh, authorized biography. And uh, now you've gone and written it yourself, which is great. And then we also said um, 
more of his letters that haven't yet been published. And as it turns out, later this year, the Tolkien Estate is finally publishing an expanded edition of the original Humphrey Carpenter edited letters. And uh, these are uh, letters that I understand they're, 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 it's not so much letters that we're getting because now, um, you know, Christopher Tolkien is gone. And so, you know, certain private things are being put out that he wouldn't have wanted. It's not that. It's it's more that um, the book was originally going to be longer and they had to make it shorter for uh, just convenience of publishing and expenses and everything. And so now they're putting out the expanded version with the original publishing plan. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I think 150 letters were cut from the original volume. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because now, like, well, why did they cut the letters? But um, I've heard a talk from Priscilla Tolkien, the late Priscilla Tolkien, in which she noted that when letters originally came out um, in America, they didn't sell well. Um, in fact, they hmm. got remaindered at certain points. Um, and then it then it picked up again later. Um, so I, I think that it was simply a strategic publishing decision. Like, well, we're we're not quite sure if there's an audience for any letters from mm. Tolkien. Let's keep it relatively manageable. And of course, now, like, yes, there's the audience. So yes. I'm glad. That yes, there is, it. and he's delightful. I mean, he's a great. Uh, we've we've also done uh, a couple of his letters, I think, on the Catholic Culture Audiobooks podcast, and uh, it's. He's a great, you know, it's like people love to read Flannery O'Connor's letters and and Tolkien's letters are just as enjoyable if you if you enjoy his work. Yeah. He is um, he is one of so. I think it it was um his granddaughter Joanna described him as as one of the great letter writers of of the century. Right. And I he he was a For sure. great letter writer. Um and yeah. I'm really I'm really pleased. You know, one of the things that I did in in Tolkien's uh, Faith, the new the new biography is really to dig into a lot of the existing letters because they often been a little bit overlooked we we are in a sense so familiar with them that we miss some of the really interesting things that he's giving us um in part because in in the letters as published they're they're presented in chronological order logically but much of his reflection on his on his life comes in the later letters as he's reflecting on it so we have all these insights about his life jumbled up not in chronological order and so hmm. one of the things I did was to tease them all out and put them in the context of what was going on in his life when he when this was happening um, and really looking at what was happening in his faith at different moments of his life was tremendously illuminating. You know, for instance, he, he says in the letters that he went through a, a stretch in which, by his own account, he almost ceased to practice his religion. And right. that's right there in the letters. But have we come to grips with that? And I tried to do that. And one of the things that I discovered was it comes in the context of right after the Great War when he's been demobilized. Right. And I was able to, to provide, I think, some context that helps us understand what was going on in that moment in his spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And it really shows us that his, his spiritual life was, was hard won. It wasn't just coasting from an easy initial faith of his childhood. He had right. many occasions when it would have been a lot easier for him relationally and professionally to go back to being an Anglican because that was his, he was baptized an Anglican. Um, mm, right. you know, he, but he didn't. And that sense of his faith being hard won is, is something I think comes out in Tolkien's faith. And I'm excited to, to put that in front of readers. Excellent. Well, great. I guess I'll link to all this stuff in the, the show notes. I'll link to this to pre-order that. I'm, I'll am i link to the letters for that matter if people are interested in pre-ordering that. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Holly. This was great. And uh, yeah. My pleasure. Great. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to help support uh, Catholic Culture's podcast network, including this show, please go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. If you'd like to help us out, we pray for our benefactors every day. And uh, even if you can't donate, please pray for us. Um, and uh, I will see you next time. The Catholic Culture Podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Mike Aquilina, Catholic Culture audiobooks bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.